Thank you everyone for being here one more time in this beautiful morning with Stephen Silver. I know everyone will know who is Stephen Silver or maybe you already know who he is, but we'll still give you an insight of who Stephen Silver is. So right now, he's an art, direct, an art recruiter at Disney Television Animation. Steven started his career as a character designer in renamed studios such as Warner Bros. Entertainment, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, Walt Disney Studios, and many more. Plus, he has participated in projects such as Kim Posible, Danny Phantom, Penguins of Madagascar, television series, and many, many more. Finally, he founded his own academy called the Stephen Silver Academy, teaching many young professionals within the industry to improve as artists and land better jobs opportunities in big companies. So, Stephen, having a very long career, what was the seed that inspired you to become that character designer you are today? You know, I actually, I, I always like telling this story because it's very miraculous on what happened for me. I, I was originally born in London, England. And when I was around six years old, I just remember I was looking out my bedroom window and I saw something laying in my backyard and I went down to my backyard and I found it was an original artist sketchbook laying in my yard. It had original portraits, it had landscapes. And from that point on, I just started drawing. So it was almost in this crazy way, this divine purpose for I'm supposed to draw and do something with this in my life. And that's how I just started drawing. And eventually I moved into just loved watching cartoons growing up. Uh, that was just something that always inspired me. I eventually started to discover illustrators, people like Norman Rockwell, who was very famous American illustrator. And I just really fell in love with his sense of caricature and his sense of storytelling. And that led me on a journey just to discovering a lot of other artists. And then I, I decided I want to, I was around 18 years old, I decided I'm going to do caricatures. And that's where I, I really found a real love. And I was doing that all through high school. I was making fun of my friends, making fun of my teachers, <laughs> and just having a lot of fun with that. And eventually it led to a job working at an amusement park in San Diego, California, where I grew up. And that was the really the beginning of this journey and that constant observation. I think that's one of the most important things that I've learned along my journey as an artist is the importance of observing other artists and learning and trying to take in as much information that you can, doing a lot of practicing and never really knowing what the next step was going to be. I, I thought maybe I would start setting up my own caricature operations, which I did, and I would hire other artists. And then I had always, I always believe in showing up. Anytime you hear of a great podcast, anytime you hear of a great gallery show, anytime you hear of anything that's art related that you feel might be of interest to you, show up. And I did that with an organization called the National Cartoonist Society. And every month they would have a guest speaker. And one of those guest speakers worked in animation. He was a storyboard artist on a television series called Freakazoid. And I, I watched the show at the time and I, I really uh, loved what he had to say. And something that I always did, I would always bring my sketchbook with me. I would always bring some sort of artwork to show someone just because I always wanted feedback. And I think that was a very important part of this process was getting feedback from people. And I showed him my artwork and he said, hey, you're pretty good. You know, you've got a lot of work to do, but keep in touch. So it took me about a, a year of just really, I just decided I'm going to develop my skill. I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to go to figure drawing classes. I'm going to really just do my best. And it took about a year and I reached back out to him and he remembered me and we had conversation. And then he invited me up to Warner Brothers Animation, uh, where he was working at the time, uh, just to 
invite me there and show me what he did. And I bought my portfolio and I showed him what I did. And he said, uh, you know what? You you look like uh, you'd be a great character designer. And I never went to school. I never went to art school. I just, I left call, I left uh, high school. I went to about a year of junior college and it just wasn't for me. Academically, I just wasn't there, was never good in school, but I was always yeah. focusing on drawing. And, and, and that was what it was for me. And he um, and uh, he at that time, he said, I think they're looking for a character designer on the fifth floor for a show called Hysteria. Let me take your portfolio up there. And he took my portfolio and he dropped it off with them and just introduced me to the producer that was up there. The di- hiring director wasn't there and said, just uh, here's this young, you know, guy who's very talented. Here's his portfolio. And I, I just left it, dropped it off. And that was it. And then about um, a couple of days later, I heard back from them saying the director would like to meet you. So that was something that was um, really great. And, and, and so from that point, they, they called me and said the director would like to meet you. And I came up to meet with them and he gave me uh, a, a test. They said, we've got this show. We want to see what you can do. And a lot of the studios will give you a test. Some of them, some not. They, they like to look at your portfolio and they're going to make their judgment from there. And from taking that test, that's what ended up getting me that job. They liked what I did. I turned in my work. I was very passionate. I was very persistent. I was very, I was like, they said, come back in a couple of weeks. I came back in a week and showed them my work. And I then they really, um, to, that's part of the test, right? Is just to make sure, are you going to, uh, show up? Are you going to make sure you get your work done on time? And that's how it sort of really, my career really started from that point. Mm-hmm. And then I moved from San Diego to Los Angeles back in 1997. And that's when I started my official career as a character designer. Most people watching this podcast might be saying, wow, a Disney recruiter. <laughs> I want to say this. So um, why don't you tell us uh, what's the what's the role there? I mean, And what would be for someone that has the skills and also must have the drive that you just mentioned? I mean, show up, be persistent, be consistent at the same time. Uh, What's the role and what does someone in Latin America with the skills and the drive need to do to reach you? Yeah. um, So my my role now, so my whole career, I was, um, as you mentioned, was doing character designer, working for many different studios. So I had the opportunity to be in that chair. And as a designer or any role, whether you want to be a prop designer, background designer, storyboard artist, it's very important to get real specific on what area of the animation industry you want to work in. There's a lot of the smallest studios, they may hire what they call generalists. Mm -hmm. And that's where you, they kind of want you to do many different roles. But in the bigger studios, they want that specific. Are you you skilled in this area? Those are what the jobs they're hiring for. And me having all this experience as a character designer, um, and I have a re- you know just a good eye for art, and I've always been as a teacher with you know as you know with my Silver Drawing Academy, and oh and and teaching all the time and looking at so many different portfolios all the time, I just have this eye. I can see. I know what the studios are looking for. I was there. And so I, during this process of me being involved in this role and doing some art direction and, and working with so many people, I decided I wanted to do something that can now I can help start to help other people. So what would that be? And that's what led me into being a recruiter and being hired for Disney. Now they saw, hey, th- this guy, he has the experience. Let's bring him in. And now my role is to seek out and find the talent for the different productions. So what people need to know when they're looking to get into the animation studio is like I mentioned, number one, get specific on your strength. Maybe it is character design, maybe it's storyboard, storyboard revisionist, maybe background location, maybe background color. Maybe you just like doing cleanup and you're really good at cleanup. So find find that real specific voice that you want to share. The next thing is to make sure that you have a really 
strong portfolio um, and a website. So putting together a website that really showcases your artwork just very clearly and, and variety. Variety is one of the most important aspects of this industry. You, really? I like, to, I like to put it this way. I like to kind of say, imagine if you had a portfolio and it just had apples and oranges and pears in it, they may look at your portfolio and say, that's really great, great apples, oranges and pears, but we don't see any strawberries. And the show that we're doing is full of strawberries. Therefore, I don't know if that person's going to be the right person for the job. So the more versatility you have, the more variety and say it is just character design, but you're showing you can do preschool. You're showing that you can do prime time. You're showing you can do action adventure. You're showing you can do something a lot more cartoony, squash and stretch. And if you can showcase that versatility, that's going to give you more opportunities in this industry. It's something I've been teaching and training artists for years because that's one of the biggest problems that I find today when I look at portfolios is people who just have one specific style and one specific look, where that's very important in the illustration world, in the illustration business. If you want to be an illustrator and do book covers and magazines and uh, art directors, they're going to be looking for that strong style. And they'll say, we need something that let's just say it's very uh, graphic in nature. And we love the bright colors you do and this graphic design. That's what we want for the cover of our magazine. That's what we want for the cover of this book. So that's why they want to make sure you're very specific. But animation, you got to be a chameleon. And that's mm -hmm. where you're going to have a lot of opportunities by doing that. And then when you have that in your portfolio, the most important thing is just to have it really clear, almost have it like a a, a nice gallery format where you can scroll down and, and you can see the information, all your different designs and see what is it you're doing. And that's the same with storyboards and backgrounds and any position yeah. show that versatility because that's, what's going to help you get noticed. Do you have any experience hiring people from Latin America? Does that come very often? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's something that also just all, all throughout my industry, I feel like we've all, we've been quite diverse and, and versatile, just trying to bring in just different backgrounds. And even more so today, I think that's something that Disney really focuses on uh, with Latin America and just try to just get bring in just different understanding from cultures, because I feel it's so important. Every Every um, every culture has something different to showcase, something different to say, uh, an experience that they can bring to the table where you may be doing a show that has something to do with may, maybe a Latin country that maybe people aren't familiar with. But maybe you're this Latin artist and say you're doing backgrounds and you go, gosh, where I lived, I can really you know, I, I remember just seeing, you know, the streets and, and, and the way that, the, you know, the shopping carts on the streets and the vendors. And there's there's a feeling, there's an experience that you can bring that experience into your artwork. And and really what it comes down to, which is the most important thing, is that skill set. You know, it, 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 I like I look at portfolios really from all over the world um, and people are being hired from all over the world. And it doesn't matter I never want people to feel like, because I feel like sometimes it could be a crutch or an excuse. They're not going to hire me because I live in Latin America. They're not going to hire me because I live in Italy. They're not going to hire me because I'm here. And I just feel like don't have that mind, don't have that mindset. You know, again, if this is something you really want, you can make it happen. And it's going to be your persistence and your drive and you putting that professional portfolio together and making sure that you, you're getting advice and that you're asking people and talking to professionals and, and getting that real feedback. How can I better my portfolio? What do I need to do to improve my skill set? And then when you see these applications, whether it's Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Disney, DreamWorks, Warner Brothers, they all are have their websites. A lot of them are on LinkedIn and they have their job uh, where you're going to apply for your job through there and you just apply. And, and again, you, you, you don't you, you never know what, what's going to happen. And if your work's there. That's really going to make all the difference in the world. But yeah, never, never feel that it's because of where you live. Never let that stop you ever. 
Um, it's just I've seen too many people from all over the world being hired in the studios. If you got the skill set, that's what counts more than anything. For young professionals that are recently graduated or they are just starting their careers in this area of character design, what are the strategies that you use to create appealing designs for clients? Because you have created, I mean, Kim Posible was one of my favorites when I was really little. So uh, how what, what is the strategy that you do to make those amazing character designs for these big companies that have been in many, many years? Kim Posible is still going, Danny yeah. Phantom also, Penguins of Madagascar. Really, the most important thing is, as I mentioned in the beginning, was observation by observing people, always carrying a sketchbook wherever you are, even if you can't find a life drawing class. You can go to the coffee shop, you can go to the park, you can go to so the beach, right, where you get to see all these different body shapes and constantly looking at people and drawing. And then from there, my what, what I'm always was doing was just be prepared to not never settle. That's one of the biggest lessons that I always teach my students is just do not settle. Don't get in the habit of just working on just one design, just drawing one character and just moving on to the next. I think you start to find the appeal and the life and the energy in drawings when you're exploring that person and you start mm -hmm. to find different ideas of what that person can represent. I think it's very important to know the story. So the things that I, I talk about and I teach are these major points of story first. So understanding that story, when you understand the story, the next step is the gesture. So now we can move into the gesture of a character because now I know that the character is sitting on the bed and they're extremely tired, all right? So that's a story. So now that's gonna inform my gesture. If I just tell you to draw someone sitting and that's it, well, are they sitting because they're tired? Are they sitting because they're nervous? Are they sitting because they're writing out a graphic novel? I mean, what, what, what are they doing while they're sitting? And so that story will lead to that gesture. And then after that, it moves to the design. Uh, so I go for the story, the, the gesture, the gesture, then the design where I start to think about what is the design of this character look like? What type of character is this person? Mm -hmm. Maybe what are they wearing? And then the next step from that I go into is the forms where now we know the story. We know the gesture. We know the design. So the next thing is to understand the forms, the construction, how to really the form build of the that character. Out. It's trying yeah. to uh -huh. exactly. And how things connect. How does that arm really connect? How does the hand connect to, to the forearm and really think about that. And then the last thing is the details. That's the cleanup line. That's the color. I find too many artists are focusing too much on the details first. They're trying to put mm -hmm. the, 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 the cherry and the cream and the, on top of the cake before the cake's even baked and it's even <laughs> finished. And I think that's a, that's a big problem that can happen with a lot of artists work where you you can see through it and i can see someone's artwork where it doesn't it's missing those elements it's missing the story the gesture the design the form and then i see the color because everyone wants to get to color they just want to finish it and then i can just see the drawing is missing there's no heart there's no story there's no appeal so why these steps are very important to go through this in order just to get to your final design through repetition and again doing many different designs sometimes when i'm designing character like even when designing kim possible designing danny phantom hundreds of designs just it, her hair long her hair short her you know her body shape different clothing styles different so many different elements and and another major thing that you always have to be willing to do and open to do is it, it's a create it's a collaborative process you're never doing this alone because and and I and I always just like to credit the people that I worked with, especially my directors, when working with them. Because as I'm doing the drawings, I'm the hand, I'm moving my hand. But to go to them and show them and say, you know, maybe we should try thinking about this a little more. Maybe we should do that. So there's a great collaborative process that works. And then it has to go to the executives and they have to see things. Do they approve? So things will always get kicked back to you. Okay, now I need to fix this a little bit more. And just be open and willing to um, share and listen is very important in this process as any sort of designer in an animator, whatever it is you wish to do in the animation industry, where it's very different 
from the comic book industry where you can be very, it's very um, solo. You you work alone a lot of the time. You're working on your drawings and then maybe it might go to an inker and then it might go to a color stance, but you're never really in the same room with them. And in animation, we're, we're, we're all in the same room. You know, pre-pandemic, of course, we were all together <laughs> in the same room working and it's a very collaborative, great way. But for the more you put into it, the more you practice, the more you aren't willing to settle, that's where your appealing designs are going to come from. Stephen, you talked about pre-pandemic time and now we are <laughs> post-pandemic, hopefully, once and for all. Yeah. Uh, yes. But things have changed a lot in the digital world. I mean, you might be, I mean, you are in a hotel right now. We are in Central yes. America. We're having this podcast and we might repeat this several times and it will just take energy, time, but it's possible. Before this, yeah. it was not that easy. Now, people, Stephen has the Stephen Silver Academy. And want to ask you, Stephen, what would be the difference between this academy, which looks amazing? I mean, we went through the website and it's just amazing. Why people would choose Thank your you. your your site, your opportunity, that opportunity instead of something else, which is, which are different options in the internet, cheaper, more expensive, different. Why choose the Stephen Silver Academy? Yeah, um, and uh, just to uh, mention that the name of the academy is uh, the Silver Drawing Academy, just if anyone's uh, looking at it. And what, what I do, I like to think about it almost like the, the College for Character Design, which is different. It's And it's really, and I'm the only person on it. It's a, it's a school. So I have such a passion for teaching. I used to have a live physical school and the pandemic happened. And then I, mm -hmm. I was always holding back on trying doing something online, having my own school. And this, the, the silver lining in that was now I have time. I'm going to do something that I've always been putting off. And that's something I always want to share with just individuals is take the time. If you have those dreams, if you have those ideas, try to at least start to put it together, write it out, just start creating that vision. And my vision for this school, the Silver Drawing Academy was to have an online school where people can learn from a professional. So I've been doing this for over 30 years now, just wow. working as a character designer. And just to really hone it into a specific craft. So it wasn't necessarily a school that was teaching all these other different disciplines, but just me where I could share my experience. And, I, and, I, and I've and and I worked in so many areas on, on the business side and the publishing side. And I thought, what better way to share, not be so local. When I had my physical school, you had to be in California. You had to be in Los Angeles. But now I thought having this online, this gives access to the world and I wanted to make it affordable for the world, for anyone living in Latin America, anyone, just anyone living anywhere to have this access and say, I need to, I want to learn. I don't, I want to learn from someone who's done it. I want to learn from someone who's been there, who has the experience and someone that I can ask questions to. I feel like a, some online schools there, they, you can sign up and then you watch the videos and yeah. that's it. My school what's different about it is I meet with the students every single week. We have these drawing hangouts together where you're a, there's a community on the website where there's a lot of interaction. And so you have direct access to me to say, Stephen, I'm struggling with this. I'm, I'm, it's, things aren't working or showing me your artwork. And this isn't, I'm not sure what to do to make this better. And then I'm able to work with you and help you through that and, and keep guiding you. And that's where I feel like it's a lot different from a lot of the other schools and just this real concentrated attention. And every week you get it, you'll get a newsletter. I also have these talks, which they, I call them art talks where I talk about life, I talk about philosophy, I talk about breaking into the industry. So it's not just get better at drawing, it's the mindset. And I think that's what exactly. separates my school a lot more than this is just really teaching the mindset. Because if you get in the right mindset, again, no matter where you live in the world, and you decide that this is what I want to do, and you start to really put your effort and energy into this, it's going to be possible. And what the benefit, to be honest, with this pandemic, 
the studios, we always had to be there. You had to show up. You had to sit at the studio, be in the bullpen, so to speak, just working there. Once the and and once the pandemic happened, the animation industry realized you don't have to to be there all the time. We were the only industry that was thriving when all the live action uh, studios shut down. They they weren't producing anything and animation was going and they realized, wow, we can still run this production with all these artists all working from home. And it, it turned around pretty quickly and it became very effective. And now because of that, that opened up so many doors for artists living all over the world. I was in Spain. I had done a talk in Spain and met um, a couple of artists there who had just been hired by Nickelodeon uh, oh. doing, and, and that that was actually pre-pandemic right before, uh-huh. you know, that actually happened, but they were hired, were living in Spain, working on a Nickelodeon show. But once again, the pandemic happened. Well, now, doesn't matter where you live in the world you could you know you could be working out of a hotel you could be working out of a you know a starbucks coffee shop it doesn't matter if you got your work done and it was done at a professional level and you did a good job it 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 works and that's still today so today when the studio system they're not requiring everyone to go back they're doing more of a hybrid where some some productions are saying you can work um from home a uh, few days out of the week, if you want, you can come in one or two days a week. And some of the productions are saying, we don't care. You can just work from home as long as you get your work turned in. And so this has opened up possibilities for many artists. And I know from when I see artist portfolios come through, I again, so many artists from Latin America that, that I just see because there's a Great. hunger and then there's, there's yeah. people who want to do. And I see that. And if I see their portfolio, and I feel like this is really awesome, great stuff. The team needs to see this. I'm putting their name and information forward, and then the productions are going to decide whether it's the right fit or not. But yeah, the, the, this is it's the system is working in favor for artists now. Um, absolutely, Stephen. I want to ask you about a book that really catch my attention when I, I was um, searching for your page. There's a book called The Silver Way, The Art of Self-Publishing. It caught my attention. Yeah. And I want to ask you how to self-publish our, for people who really are creators, content developers, and they have their own stories or their own book, children's stories. Um, what advice would you give to where to start publishing, like self-publishing? What advice would you give to them? Yeah, well, the first thing is just to start, right? I, I feel like there's that saying, it came from a movie, that like, build it and they will come. So, and, and that's what it is. And that's what I think we all need to do is first, just build it. Start, get that idea. What What is that graphic novel going to be? What is that children's going to be. And then from there, once you create it and you start to understand that now it's up to you, whether you want to self-publish. So my whole life, um, for the most part, I was self-publishing my own books. I, I created my own books the way that I wanted to do it. And then there's a lot of publishing, uh, well, printing companies. So publishing and printing are two different things. There's the printing companies, which are going to be the ones where, and there's actually quite a few in Latin America, um, where you could get them print, get your books printed, right? So that you're going to pay them. They're going to send you all the books. And now it's up to you to start going out there and trying to sell it, whether you're going to conventions, whether you're going to a meeting with a bookstore owners, Owners, you know, not big ones necessarily like the big Barnes and Nobles or uh, but more like maybe independent bookstores. And you can move into that direction as a self-publisher, put it on your website, put sell it on Etsy. You can do a lot of different things trying to sell it that way and market it. Maybe you're going to create a Kickstarter campaign and maybe try to gain interest that way. And then there's the other realm of doing working through a publisher where that was what I did recently with my most recent book, which was called The Silver Way, which was uh, Tips, Techniques and Tricks for Character Design. And that was through a publisher where I went to them and I proposed my book to them and they liked the idea and they end up publishing it and printing it. And then now they're putting it out into a lot of the different bookstores, but I still sell it through my website and conventions. So that that's the other route where you can now maybe take your book, even when it's finished, even just a prototype and start meeting with publishers 
and you just research and Google. Like I know just out in in America, and I'm sure in Latin, some parts of Latin America for sure, there's there's um, publishing. There's one called Book Expo America, and that's a big publishing convention. So what you want to do is start just showing up to licensing shows, publishing shows. Go to these where you can start to inform yourself and learn about them. And that's where, again, showing up where you can potentially meet people. And that's really what's happened throughout my whole life is even when I got my book published was I met the person at a convention and I told them my idea and one thing led to another. So the more you put yourself out there, the more you show up and research and be willing to research and have the question, because when you have the question, you can find the answer very easily today, more so than ever. Imagine like a hundred years ago, 30 years ago, before the internet, it was in part, you know, it's so hard. You had to go to the library, go to the bookstore. Now, you want to find out anything, you just Google search it or whatever, you know, you use and you can find the answer. And it's always just building upon these different pieces. And eventually you'll start to discover the, the best way to, to do what it is that you want to do. It's just a matter to show up, yeah. like you mentioned, <laughs> Stephen. So what's in yes, the future that's it. for Stephen Silver? What about the next five years, 10 years? What are you looking for, Stephen? For me, you know, I, I feel like my whole, my, my purpose in life is to teach. My purpose in life is to help make an impact and share knowledge with other people. And I really, I, I try, I don't think so much far ahead as what that next step's going to be as much as, Am I doing what I'm intending to do just right now? Am I enjoying what I'm doing right now? And I always feel like having that attitude, it always just leads to something else. I, 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 like, I have this saying, and I say, piece by piece will bring you peace. And I feel that's what it is. I'm not looking for this long road or what that main thing way out there is and just trying to take it all in. I feel that if I just do one thing at a time, and take those little bites and enjoy what it is that I'm tasting and doing, it'll lead, not only give me the peace that I seek, that I desire in this life, but it'll also just lead to that next thing, which is a mystery, which is uncertain. And I love that. I love spontaneity. I love the idea that anything can happen at any time for you, as long as you, again, once again, the mindset, if you have that right mindset and say, I'm I'm going to try this and I'm going to do this. So for me, my real focus right now is the Silver Drawing Academy um, and I'm working on that. I, I, I did my book, The Silver Way, which actually was just recently published in Spanish. Um, oh, so there's a Spanish version now. Uh, yeah, there's a Japanese version and a Spanish oh, version wow. of The Silver Way. Uh, too. And again, I wasn't expecting that. I just, all it was, was I started with this idea. I want to create a book right now that teaches people everything that I've learned in the last 30 years of my life as a character designer, put it all together in 248 pages and let's see what happens. And I put it out there and people were responding to it. People were reacting to it. A lot of schools are using that book now for their book to teach their They're students. They're teaching, yeah. And making, yeah, using it as the manual. And then all of a sudden I get from my publisher, hey, they want to turn it and make a Spanish version of this book. A Spanish publisher wants to do it. A Japanese publisher, wants, wow, wasn't expecting that. Didn't know that was going to happen. And that's how I just go. So I, I feel like as long as I keep for myself pursuing my purpose in life, which is to help impact other people's lives and teach, I, I feel I, I'm not expecting anything i'm not chasing anything i'm not trying to work on my own movie i'm not trying to create i'm not trying to get any sort of awards or do anything i'm just i'm just happy doing you know doing what i'm doing and, and seeing what the world you know what the universe <laughs> provides you know what, what, you're what enjoying the ride that, that's what you're doing yes. you're enjoying the ride exactly. exactly well we're coming we're coming to the end of the podcast um, it seems like, um, and my final suggestion would be for you to say a few words to inspire all those people that are listening to this in Latin America. You've said a lot, that is already inspiring a lot, a lot of people, but please give us your final words, 
Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think what I just like to say is we've heard it many times, but just don't give up. Don't give up on your dreams of what just because it's not working or happening or it's easy right now. And I like to say just because things are difficult doesn't make it impossible. And I always want you to remember that is that your willingness to try and don't listen. There's going to be people that are going to tell you that it's not the right choice for you. It's you shouldn't pursue this, that it's going to be hard. And don't you, you got to be very careful not to let that affect you. You need to make your own decisions in life and you're going to make your own mistakes in life and you're going to fail along this journey. And it's all just part of the process. And if you realize that because this is just happening right now, let me see if there's something else that I can do differently. This idea didn't work. That person I thought was going to help me out wasn't the person I thought was going to help me out. This, I just want to, this is what I want to do in my life. And I feel like if you work on your skill set academically, your skill, you start to develop whatever it is that eventually may, you might not know exactly what it is you want to do right now. You may not know if you want to be a storyboard artist, a painter, a comic book artist, but if you focus on just building your strength in your artwork, get good, get good, build, learn how to draw hands, learn how to draw the folds in clothing, learn how to just do the things that you want to do that you foresee yourself possibly doing. All those people and those artists that you follow, that you admire their artwork, just know that they were all in the exact same place as you one day. They were scared. They were nervous. They didn't know what they were wanted to be in their life, but they knew that if I worked hard at this, that eventually something might happen. And you'll find that everyone has a different story. Everyone has a different journey. And you'll hear from all of them that sometimes it was just that one person that they met, that one podcast that they listened to was the difference that completely changed the dynamic and trajectory of their world. And just believe in that. And I think just through doing this, you'll eventually find what it is that you want to do. So carry that sketchbook pay attention with purpose, and eventually you're going to find your way, but most importantly, never give up.